to thank the organizers for the invitation and for this chance to talk about uh, kinetic theory in low temperature physics. I will give three examples to illustrate the different behaviors in the quantum case from the classical one. Uh, give one example on a spin in the fermionic case. Second example will be a kinetic anion equation. And the third example will be low temperature bosons in a condensate. Uh, these examples will illustrate some general differences between quantum and classical Boltzmann theory. And I'll say a few words about that towards the end. Uh, let's see, yes, the first quantum kinetic equation was introduced by Nordheim in 1928 for bosons and fermions. Uh, in his case, he looked at quantum particles which were so rarefied that between the collisions, they interacted in a classical way. So the transport part of the equation is classical, only the collision part is, um, is quantum. The particular equation, uh, co uh, collision part for, for uh, the Boltzmann-Nordheim equation is this, and we notice that it differs from the classical Boltzmann equation by the filling factors. Also, we notice that for the Nordheim equation, the quartic terms, they cancel out. You can add spin in the fermionic case by switching from densities to functions with values among uh, 2 times 2 Hermitian matrices. And we recall that uh, the Pauli spin matrices are Hermitian and uh, the space of 2 times 2 Hermitian matrices are spanned by the Pauli spin matrices and the identity matrix. Uh, if we have a gas with spin and we represent it by a function with values in these uh, um, two times two Hermitian matrices, uh, then it turns out to have interesting new properties in comparison with the classical case. For instance, you can have spin waves and uh, sound waves going in different directions. The Boltzmann equation for for, for uh, these uh, uh, matrices looks the same as usual. But the collision operator is different. Uh, in 1988, Gion and Mullin suggested this uh, collision operator. Here, the um, uh, uh, brackets with plus, they are anti-commutators. And the tilde means that you take identity minus the operator. If you take the trace of rho, then you get the density. If you multiply rho by um, the vector of Pauli spin matrices and take the trace, then you get the spin vector. So rho can be written with the help of density and spin. Uh, it turns out that this equation, initial value for it, can be solved in the same way as uh, the um, Nordheim equation in the Fermi-Dirac case, uh, and in approximately the same generality as Pierre-Louis Lyons did 
in the uh, density case. So uh, we, have, we have here uh, um, the kernel, which is of roughly the same type as, as in Leon's uh, uh, result. And <coughs> what, what I obtain is that if you take densities, bounded of course, and with a spin bounded by the density and 2 minus the density, then the equation has a bounded integrable solution and the solution satisfies the same bounds on, on uh, 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 density and spin. Now, once you know uh, that, uh, that, that uh, um, uh, approximations initially have these properties, then, of course, if you could prove that the approximation satisfy this, then if you look at the terms in the collision operator, they are of roughly the same type as in Leon's case. So you can prove the existence by using his methods or for some terms by slight extensions of those methods because the structure is not exactly the same. So an important question is why does the uh, equation preserve this uh, control of spin by density. Well, uh, probably the most elegant way of seeing it is due to Lukarinen, May and Sporn. And they looked at the gain term and found that the gain term has the property that if you plug in uh, a Hermitian matrix, then the gain term is Hermitian. If you plug in a matrix with positive eigenvalues, then the gain term has the same property. So if you write the equation in exponential form, then you can essentially read out the property that, that uh, a spin is controlled by, by uh, density. So that was the first example. The second example will be a kinetic onion equation. So let's recall what onions are. You take two quantum particles, uh, identical, and look at their wave function in terms of uh, center of mass coordinates and relative coordinates. Now, if the particles are bosons and you switch them, that is, you change phi to phi plus pi, then you get the factor one in front. If the particles are fermions, you get a factor minus one. And in three and more dimensions, these are the only possibilities. But in 1977, uh, Lenos and Mülheim proved that there is no such restriction in less than three dimensions. So in less than three dimensions, you can have any phase factor in front when you switch. And the, uh, the new type of particles were called anions. Uh, when you have a gas of anions, it, uh, of course, has some kind of statistics, and that statistics turned out to be uh, a generalization of uh, um, the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, in these statistics, if you have an ideal gas, oh, that was wrong. If you have an ideal gas, then in equilibrium, it has a distribution function like this, alpha between zero and one, epsilon uh, kinetic energy, mu a chemical potential, uh, and uh, W a function satisfying this equation. In particular, for alpha equal zero, you get bosons. For alpha equal one, you get fermions. So, we would of course also want to know what the um, Boltzmann equation looks like. <clears throat> so the question is, what is, what is the collision term? Uh, it turns out that the collision term 
uh, is the same that was uh, found by, by uh, um, oh, I, I forgot, it doesn't matter. Uh, the collision term is, is given by a generalization of the, uh, um, with the weight factors which are a generalization of those in the uh, fermionic and bosonic cases. And here we can see that we have a um, kind of a, a generalization of the Pauli exclusion principle. You cannot have too many particles at one point. If you look at the collision operator, you also see uh, uh, that there is no longer any cancellation of the highest order terms. And, of course, this t uh, f factor has only a value when f is smaller than or equal to 1 over alpha. Uh, and we want positive solutions, so we will only be looking at s between 0 and 1 over alpha. But when f is close to 1 over alpha, then the integrand here is no longer Hilbert, uh, so, sorry, Lipschitz continuous. It's only Hölder continuous. That's an extra, pro extra difficulty. Uh, with uh, Anuri, we decided to look at this problem in the space-dependent case in the simplest possible situation. Uh, so we started with, uh, we, we actually took one space variable and two velocity variables. I mean, onions, no more than two velocity variables anyhow. Uh, we require that mass and energy exist to, to start with, and um, we have some technical condition. And then the initial value problem, we prove that for a simple enough kernel, we had just took a bounded function with cutoff uh, for, for um, uh, grazing collisions and for small relative velocities. Then uh, we found that there is a strong solution which uh, pres preserves this property actually gets it slightly better. And uh, if we go just a small time ahead from zero and choose any big time, then in between there, the solution will be bounded from above below one over alpha. The solution is unique and stable in the L1 norm, and it conserves mass, first moments, and energy. Uh, actually, the same approach that we use can be used to get some regularity for the solutions. And the result seems to be new also in uh, the Fermi-Dirac case. Uh, if you use the, our approach on classical Boltzmann, you find that in the corresponding situation, those solutions uh, are strong and conserve energy. Uh, so. Uh, how, how, how do we handle it? Well, if we look formally on the collision operator, then we notice that if f is zero, then it's only the gain term, so that the derivative should be increasing, so it should go up from zero. If f is one over alpha, then the gain term is zero, so the derivative should be negative, and f should decrease. To, uh, prove such a behavior rigorously, we have to have a good control of integral f, f dv. And uh, we, ch we checked with three different methods, and uh, they gave the same type of results. So we settled for, for a method based on uh, the Bonny functional, estimates of the Bonny functional. That the estimates for the Bonny functional work in one space dimension. That explains that why we have one space dimension. And it turns out that the proofs for, for, for the onions uh, require, uh, they are kind of a complication in the proof, so they require two, two uh, velocity dimensions. So with the method, one space dimension, two velocity dimension is kind of best we can hope for. Now, uh, with the help of the estimates for the Bonnet functional, we can get the control of this. And once we have it, we can prove that starting a little bit after time zero up to an arbitrary time, 
then the solution will remain uniformly away from 1 over alpha. That means the integrand is Lipschitz continuous and we can use contraction mapping techniques to, to, to uh, uh, construct uh, solutions uh, one step at a time. For the initial interval, uh, we use contraction mapping techniques direct, directly with the Hölder continuity. So that's, that's, that's uh, the basic structure of the proof. Uh, my third example will be low temperature bosons in a condensate. So we take a condensate and we give it some extra energy, that means we'll get some excitations moving like quasi-particles in it, uh, like a gas of quasi-particles. And uh, then we'll try to model this. We'll model the condensate by a gross pitayevsky equation and the ev evolution of, of the... Um, quasi-particles by a Boltzmann-type equation. Uh, the gross pitayevsky equation, it's uh, an extension of the Schrödinger equation uh, with a term um, taking into account the, mute, uh, the pair interactions between the particles in the condensate. Uh, in our case, there are two extra terms. One term this one, because the uh, condensate moves in the field of the excitations. And this term, this dissipation term, because to, to, to account for the interaction between the condensate and the excitations. Uh, the factor G you have here, uh, it's proportional to the scattering length. As for the... Um, Kinetic part is the collision operator should describe collisions between the condensate and the excitations. Nc is the density of the condensate. E is the kinetic energy of, of the excitations. And F is, of course, the density of the excitations. <coughs> now, uh, we will do this in, in, in a, a particular situation, but, uh, uh, and our goal, this, this I have developed also with Anuri, and our goal was to prove stability of this type of a problem. So uh, we start close to equilibrium, and we hope that the solutions, and we prove that the solutions will be staying there. We also introduce a mean free path, so instead of the collision operator, we have 1 over epsilon times the collision operator, where epsilon is the mean free path. And it turns out that the domains of stability are of the magnitude of uh, uh, scattering length divided by mean free path square. Uh, of course, we have to be below the temperature TC where a condensate forms. Uh, there are different behaviors in different uh, temperature intervals. We decided to look at the, uh, at the temperature interval around 0 0.7 TC. That is, temperature is low enough for the collisions between excitations to be of of no interest any longer. So there is no uh, Boltzmann-Nordheim term in, in the problem. And it is high enough for the collective excitations not to play any role. So we can make a cutoff, <coughs> we can make a cutoff for, for, for low velocities. Incidentally, um, in Escobedo's talk a little bit later today, I understand that, that uh, um, uh, he will be looking at a lower temperature range where you cannot make uh, a, 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 a cutoff for, for low velocities. 
the, his uh, problem is in the same ballpark as, as this one. Uh, if you take if you take uh, the collision uh, term in, in, in equilibrium, then it should of course be zero. So if you multiply by logarithm of f over one plus f, uh, this equation pops out, which tells you that the quotient is uh, Maxwellian, so that uh, f itself has to be a Planckian. Since we can, because of this, we can change variables, velocity variables, we can write the Planckian in this way. Uh, so what Nuri and me are doing is to look at perturbations of an equilibrium, the Planckian for, for, for the gas of excitations and the constant for, for the condensate. And uh, this uh, same structure will, of course, also have to give to the initial values. Uh, we use a cylindrical symmetry in velocity space with the symmetry axis uh, al along uh, the space axis x. Um, and we are looking in, in a slab situation, that is. So we'll have to have a, a cutoff function uh, for low velocities in the collision operator. And uh, then we get the problem to, 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 to study this one. Here is the kinetic equation, initial values. Here is, here is the uh, um, gross pitayevsky equation for the condensate. <clears throat> now, if you think of the physical situation, you have a condensate, you have some excitations of it, it evolves. There is no possibility with periodic boundary conditions for, for, for mass to, to disappear from the system or to, to be added. So we should have conservation of total mass. Uh, the total mass at time zero should be the total mass in the equilibrium. And then formally, the uh, equation system preserves this. <coughs> now, it also turns out that the um, uh, kinetic equation it, it conserves uh, the, um, the hydrodynamic moments. So <coughs> we'll have to require of the uh, initial perturbations that they satisfy this condition. This condition here is uh, the condition for total mass conservation. Uh, we work in, a sp in an L2 space and uh, Uh, the solutions for the kinetic part will be strong solutions. The solutions for the um, gross pitayevsky equation will be of uh, um, H, H1 type, like this. Our result is that if we start in a neighborhood of the, of the magnitude uh, scattering length di uh, divided by, by mean free path squared, then there are solutions up to, to time infinity. And uh, these solutions have the correct conservation properties. And uh, also, it turns out that the perturbation of, of the kinetic part, uh, it um, decreases uh, exponentially. Let's see, uh, here, it decreases exponentially. Oh, and that, since there is mass conservation, we'll also have that the uh, perturbation of, of, of the um, uh, condensate mass uh, goes to its equilibrium exponentially. Moreover, the um, kinetic and, and internal energies of the gross pitayevsky part are bounded, and they converge exponentially to the, uh, their uh, limit when time tends to infinity. So uh, we, have, we have stability and we have exponential convergence in this sense to stability uh, solution, to, to, to the equilibrium solution. So how do we prove it? Well, the local part 
is proved in a simple way. We use classical techniques, we uh, can choose between many, which we have uh, chosen the Fourier techniques. The interesting part is, is to go from local to global, because here we have a gross pitayevsky equation which is not on its own, it's coupled to, to, to the excitations. And due to this coupling, uh, the gross pitayevsky condensate solutions cannot deviate too much from their initial value. That is the engine behind the proof, and I think this 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 is um, this is a new kind of a, a new phenomenon in 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 in, in, in this uh, context. Uh, so now I have uh, shown you. Yes, I should also say that if we if we change if we change from periodic boundary conditions to, say, diffuse reflection boundary conditions. Then, uh, of course, uh, we'll get for, for, for the um, uh, guess of uh, excitations, uh, we'll get boundary layers. That means we'll be interested in mean problems, and uh, with Nuri we solved this mean problem. It turned out to be different from the classical mean problem in the sense that uh, the, the linearized uh, um, Collision operator does not have mass in its uh, kernel, which means that uh, we had to, to uh, uh, put, put in new ideas in order to, to study the, the mean problem. However, if you look at the corresponding, corresponding discrete case, uh, it seems that th the natural way of looking at the mean problem there is the same in the classical case and in this quantum case, and I think think that uh, um, Bernhoff will be talking about that in, in his talk later today. So here we have seen three examples, and we can use them to exemplify some, some general properties for, for um, uh, the quantum kinetics uh, uh, in, in um, contrast to the classical case. Of course, when you have a quantum kinetic problem, you can always put your favorite classical questions to it. Uh, but uh, you have to be aware that uh, the collision operators here, they are obtained by physics arguments and usually not by, by, by validation. So there is sometimes not complete agreement about what the collision terms look like. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, outside of uh, the uh, Boltzmann-Nordheim uh, situation, it's only uh, Spohn and Lukarinen who have been looking into validation questions here. So mo most, most remains to be done. Uh, also, in order to, to solve these quantum problems, you may need quite new ideas, as, uh, as uh, in um, the example of uh, onion existence. Or uh, you may need to add extra ideas in comparison to the classical case, as in the Milne example. Uh, also, the quantum results may throw new light on the classical situation, as, as the, uh, well, I mentioned that when you used the, the onion method for classical Boltzmann, you got an energy conservation, such an example. Uh, the collision operators, they are very varied and often quite different from the classical case. Uh, due to the new collision operators, you sometimes get quite new phenomena, like, like the spin waves uh, going in a different direction from, from the sound waves. Uh, also, there are very many experimental results in the low temperature area, which should correspond to new properties of the uh, kinetic equations. So I think that is, that is a fertile area to look into. Uh, also, 
uh, you know from the Boltzmann Norden case that the filling factors may uh, substantially influence the behavior of the collisions. The, the, the filling factors may be stabilizing or destabilizing. Uh, <clears throat> at low temperatures, there are usually fewer collisions. The energy levels may be discrete. In the uh, condensate example, you could only have collisions between the condensate and those excitations which t took new energy away from the condensate, because that was the bottom level, kind of. Uh, so uh, the domain of integration in this collision operator was two-dimensional and, and, not, and not as we are used to from, uh, from Boltzmann, five-dimensional. Uh, yes, um, and also the parameter ranges are quite uh, um, sensitive. There are cases when, when within very, very small changes of the parameter you get extremely different behaviors. And one example was, of course, uh, this uh, onion example. The endpoints of the parameter range alpha equals zero and one, we switched from from uh, onion behavior to, to fermion or boson behavior, and, and, and the techniques have, of course, to, to, to be completely changed. Uh, also, we are used from, from the um, classical situation to, to uh, uh, kind of a scale invariance in, 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 in the model. But here, the model is valid in a particular energy range. If you extend it outside, it may be physically quite irrelevant or even wrong. Uh, actually, the, the um, condensate example was, was, was such a case. And sometimes uh, it is only relevant to look at the problem at a bounded time interval, not out to infinity as we are used to from classical Boltzmann. I mean, after a certain time, all particles may have disappeared, simply. Maybe uh, the, the uh, problem you listened to on Monday with uh, billiard balls that exploded, uh, if you change that a little, that all of them explode after, after a, finite, a fixed finite time, then you would get something similar to what you see in the low temperature case. Okay, so there, there are big differences between the quantum and the classical uh, Boltzmann theory. Uh, what I have said is uh, taken from a survey paper which I tried to keep updated on uh, the archive and an early version was also published in JSP. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions? Where you the with the kinetic equation, right? So the question is, uh, there are situations in which you have blow up without coupling... Not here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because the exponential decay of, uh, uh, of the kinetic uh, perturbation uh, for, for forces the, the Gross-Pitayevsky to behave differently from when it is free. I mean, this, this to me is the mathematically interesting part of, uh, of, uh, of the result. More questions? <coughs> Thanks. Uh, how did you choose the interaction term between the cross mm -hmm. and the uh, and the condensate in the cross equation case? So there was an interaction connecting. There is, there is a colli the, the collision term. Yes. A kind, kind of the kinetic collision term integrated. Uh, how did you choose it? I mean, how did you end up with this form? <sighs> Well, uh, this, this has been used very much by the physicists. They justify fi, fi it fr, 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 from quantum field. So it was and coming I, from I, physics I, literature? Yeah, what? L physics literature. So you were taking it from uh, yes. physics? Okay. Yes, yes, yes I did. So I, I, I didn't build these models. I kind of took them and tried to understand them uh, as much as I could. Okay, more questions? If not, we can speak again, please.